Hey guys, so this video is on neutralization, precipitation, and redox reactions. So a neutralization reaction is just another name for an acid-base reaction, no big deal. So for example, the reaction between calcium hydroxide, a base, and cyanic, uh, hydrocyanic acid, an acid, um, to make water and calcium cyanide is, you could either call it an acid-base reaction or a neutralization reaction, you're both correct. Likewise, a precipitation reaction, it's just a double replacement reaction, but a specific kind, one where um, the reactants are aqueous and at least one of the products that's formed is a solid. So for example, in platinum 4 chloride, reacting with potassium phosphate to make platinum 4 phosphate and potassium fluoride, um, because one of the products is a solid and these are aqueous, this is a could be classified as either a double replacement reaction or, and I guess, a precipitation reaction. No big deal. Now, redox reactions. Um, redox is uh, short for oxidation reduction reactions. Um, and a redox reaction is one in which electrons are transferred from one reactant to another. Um, the species, the reactant that loses electrons in this process is said to be oxidized, and the one that gains electrons is said to be reduced. Um, now there's a mnemonic, you know, it's real easy to mix that up. Um, so there's a little mnemonic that I've found helps, and if it helps you, great. It's oil rate right over here, and it stands for oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons. So oil, oxidation is lost, whatever loses electrons is being oxidized. Rig, reduction is gain, whatever is gaining electrons is being reduced. So for example, um, in this um, net ionic equation shown describing the reaction between solid iron, metallic iron, elemental iron, and nickel 2 ion in, in, um, in solution um, to make aqueous iron 2 and solid nickel, um, we can see that here on the left hand side, the reactant side, the iron um, has a zero charge. It's in delta elemental form. Nickel has a plus 2 charge, whereas on the right hand side, iron has a plus 2 charge. Well, if it gains two positive charges, the only way that can happen is for it to lose two electrons. So it was oxidized, iron was oxidized. And the only way for nickel to um, lose its two positive charges is to gain, which it does, is to gain two electrons. So because it's gaining, it's being reduced. The nickel two ion is what's reduced. Now, it's not always that obvious um, what's losing electrons, what's gaining electrons, what's being oxidized, and what's being reduced. So we have something called oxidation numbers, which allow you to, to, to determine what species is being oxidized and what's being reduced, and that's going to be important. Um, and actually, whether or not anything is being oxidized or reduced, that's an important point. Just um, not all chemical reactions are redox reactions. In some chemical reactions, no electrons are being transferred from between reactants and those are not redox reactions. So one thing um, that redox reactions do is let you tell what's being oxidized and what's being reduced and whether or not anything is being oxidized or reduced. I'll show you how in a minute. But if um, nothing's being oxidized or reduced, or reduced, then you know this is not a redox reaction. All right, so um, the way that you calculate an the oxidation numbers and what you do is you get a chemical equation and every element in every compound, you calculate its oxidation number. Um, and I'll show you how to use that, um, the result of that in just a minute. But to calculate the oxidation number of any element in any compound, you use this list of rules right here. So you're going to want to memorize this, guys. Now this list is what we call hierarchical. That means that if two rules conflict, and sometimes they do, the one that's higher up, a lower number, um, wins. So if rules three and four conflict, rule three wins, for example. So um, first one, any element in its elemental form, the oxidation number is zero. Um, when you add up the, all the oxidation numbers in the compound, they must equal its overall charge. If there's no charge, they have to add up to be equal to zero. And then we get specific. Fluorine's oxidation number is negative one. Um, of course, rule, rule one and two um, trump that because if you look at elemental fluorine, F2, um, it, the oxidation number for fluorine there is zero because it's in its elemental form. 
and also because when you add up the oxidation numbers, they have to equal its overall charge, which would be zero. Next, the oxidation number for any group one element, alkaline metals, is plus one, and group two, alkaline earth metals, is plus, excuse me, is plus one, and then two A's, plus two. So one A is the first column in the periodic table, two A is the second column. These are plus one and plus two, respectively. Hydrogens, plus one, oxygens, negative two, any group 7A element, those are the halogens, is negative 1. So um, memorize those. Put them on your card, okay? So let's say we needed to calculate the oxidation numbers for the elements in the dichromate ion. First thing we do is write down the formula for the dichromate ion, which is right here, Cr2072 minus. Um, this is one of your polyatomic ions, guys. That's where it comes from. And so what the way this works is um, you'll, from that list, you will know the oxidation numbers of um, probably, well, you might know all the elements or you might know all of them but one. In this case, we had no rule for chromium, but we did have a rule for oxygen. Um, so the rule for oxygen says that oxygen is negative two. So what we do is we apply the second rule, which says that when we add up the oxidation numbers, they have to equal the overall charge, right? Well, the overall charge is negative two. So two times whatever the oxidation number on chromium is plus seven times the oxidation number of oxygen, which is negative two, has to have it be equal to negative two. And when you do the arithmetic, it ends up that we see the oxidation number for chromium here is plus six. So the answer to the question is the oxidation number for chromium is plus six, oxygen is negative two. Word of warning, guys, listen to this, okay? Oxidation numbers are not charges. The chromium atom in this dichromate polyatomic ion does not have a positive six charge, and oxygen does, does not have a negative two. These are, this is just a tool. It's a way of um, keeping track of where electrons are basically, or, or at, like where, where they go when they move around. So just make sure you keep that distinction clear in your mind, okay? Oxidation numbers are different than charges, and you'll see that in a minute. All right, so let's do another example, all right? Oops, this one, there we go. So. Hydrogen peroxide, its formula is H2O2. We want to calculate the oxidation numbers for the elements in this. Well, when we look at that list of rules, we see that there's a list, there's a rule for hydrogen and for oxygen, but they would conflict in here because the second rule says when we add up all the oxidation numbers, they have to be equal to zero. Well, if we put negative two for oxygen in and positive one for hydrogen, that does not add up to zero. So what we do is we apply the rule that's higher up, the one that wins. In this case, because hydrogen, the rule for hydrogen is higher in that list than the one for oxygen, we apply the rule for hydrogen and say that, okay, the oxidation number for hydrogen is plus one. Oxygen we have to find. So when we do the arithmetic here, now we see the oxidation number for oxygen is negative one. So in hydrogen peroxide, the oxidation number for hydrogen is plus one. Oxygen is negative one. So, um, the way that we, you, the reason that oxidation numbers are useful and being able to calculate them is useful is that lets us tell what is being oxidized and what is being reduced. So, in a chemical reaction, as we go from the reactant side to the product side, from the left to the right of the arrow, the, the, the element whose oxidation number becomes more positive as we go from left to right or less negative, that's, um, that's being oxidized, okay? That element is being oxidized. Likewise, if the oxidation number for an element becomes less positive, more negative, same thing, that element is being reduced. So for example, in the combustion of methane, um, and you guys, I've calculated the oxidation numbers and put them up here already, but you guys should make sure you do that and get the same oxidation numbers I have. So I found that in methane, CH4, the oxidation number for carbon is negative four, Hydrogen's plus one, and because this is elemental oxygen, the oxidation number for oxygen is zero. Now on the right-hand side of the, the arrow, uh, the carbon is plus four, its oxidation number, oxygen is negative two, hydrogen's plus one, oxygen here is also negative two. Okay, um, listen to this. I don't have an example that shows this right now, but there are times when an element can change its oxidation number in, to one, more than one value when it's in different compounds on the right hand side. So I mean it didn't happen here but it's possible that oxygen might start at zero on the left end up negative two in one place and maybe negative one in another or something. But that's not the case here. But, okay.
okay, what we do, here's how we use the oxidation numbers, guys. We see that carbon on the left goes from negative 4 to positive 4. It's becoming more positive or less negative. That's oxidation. Um, oxidation. So we, we can tell right away that first it is an oxidation, a redox reaction. And second of all, guys, carbon is what's being oxidized. Likewise, oxygen goes from 0 on the left to negative 2 on the right. Oxygen is being reduced. It's, its oxidation number is becoming less positive or um, more negative. That's how we use that. Now, as if it wasn't already confusing enough, I know, right? But this is the terminology that we have to deal with. We, we don't have a choice. Um, the element that is being oxidized is said to be the reducing agent. It's the agent by which the other thing is being oxidized, is being reduced, rather. And the element that is reduced is the oxidizing agent. So, for example, the um, question might be, in this the given equation here, what's the oxidizing agent? What's the reducing agent? So, you guys should pause the video, see if you can figure it out, and then restart once you think you've got it. All right, welcome back. So, <clears throat> calculated the oxidation numbers. Zinc on the left is zero, plus two on the right. Gold on the left is plus three, zero on the right. And chlorine ends up being negative one on both sides. I didn't bother writing that. But we see that zinc is going from zero to plus two. It's being oxidized, which means it's the reducing agent. Gold is going from plus three on the left to zero on the right. It's becoming less positive, more negative. That means gold is being, the gold three ion is being reduced, and it is the oxidizing agent. Zinc's the reducing agent. Gold is the oxidizing agent. Now, Combustion reactions, as we saw a minute ago, are examples of redox reactions. Another good example of redox reactions are single replacement reactions. Now, in a single replacement reaction, that only occurs, that, that reaction only happens if the element um, on the reactant side, you know, the one that's by itself, it's what we call more active than the element that it's replacing in the ionic compound. So, um, what does that mean, more active? It means that it releases electrons more easily. So this is a tug of war for electrons, guys. And um, if the one that has the electrons holds on to them more strongly than the other element can pull them, nothing's going to happen. Um, so this, act this is an activity series, and this is how you tell if a single replacement reaction will happen or not, because um, if the element that's by itself is higher up um, in this periodic table, uh, not periodic table, in this activity series, then it's said to be more active than the, another element that's lower down. So more active means it releases electrons more easily. So for example, if we had um, calcium that was the element by itself in a single, react, a single replacement reaction, and iron was in an ionic compound, um, then we know that reaction would happen because calcium is more active than iron. Calcium releases its electrons more easily than iron does, and so iron can the iron ion, iron two ion, can pull the electrons away from calcium, and the reaction will occur. If it's the other way around, if iron was the element by itself and calcium was in the ionic compound, no reaction would happen because um, iron is not more active than calcium. So let's see that. So for example, um, in a single replacement reaction between cobalt and magnesium chloride, um, nothing happens. And the way that we can tell that is we look at the activity series, we find cobalt right here, and we find magnesium right here. So in order for this to happen, the element that's by itself, the cobalt would have to be more active, higher in this series than the element that's in the compound, magnesium. And it's not, it's the other way around. So this reaction, no reaction occurs. On the other hand, in the single react replacement reaction between aluminum and chromium-3 bromide, because aluminum, you see, is higher in the activity series, it's more active. It releases its electrons more easily than chromium, right here. Um, this reaction does occur, and we get a single replacement reaction happening. Well, that's all there is to that, guys.